we just finished a chapter on uh, on uh, that action is the core of Judaism. Then in the end, we're a religion of action, and everything we do is surround is is uh, organized around all these physical actions we do. It's a very unique religion in that aspect, and that's the core because, as the Alter Rebbe said, the point of the entire world, of its whole creation, is to create a home for God, not somewhere up in the spiritual realms, but down here in the physical world, in my physical life. That's the whole point, that's why we're here. Including big tzaddikim, they also come here, just like me, to put a coin in a charity box, to shake a little of an etrog, right? Or, or to, uh, to, you know, to uh, spin a gragger on Purim as it's coming up. Now, in these chapters, we're going in the opposite direction because the altar wants us to remember that although the action is the main thing, is the core, that once we have that action, once we're plugged in, now we definitely want to add kavana, what's called kavana, which means emotions, intention, passion, a love uh, of uh, connecting to God through mitzvah, respect yeah. of God through connecting to mitzvah. All the oh, emotions that are included, and I'll ask anyone, uh, anyone on the, anyone on the uh, call to just mute so there's not any background noise. Yeah, yeah. How you doing? I'm Damien. Okay, Damien. I think I'll find. There you go. So anyone, anytime we do a mitzvah, once we're plugged in, now we want to have emotions. We want to have uh, feelings that allow that mitzvah to elevate and elevate. And as we'll see, and as we in fact learned in our meditation system, the, the long short path, the emotions with which we do a mitzvah, the kavana, the passion, functions as wings that allow the mitzvah to elevate to higher and higher spiritual worlds. And we're going to refine that technique of elevating the world around you by elevating your mitzvahs in the next few chapters. And the main metaphor the Alter Rebbe is using is that of body and soul. Body and soul. So any questions on Facebook yet? Let me know. So we know that when we do a physical mitzvah, we call that the body of the mitzvah. So say I am, uh, say I am cutting uh, uh, challah with a blessing on Shabbat. The body of the mitzvah is actually that physical bread that I'm cutting and eating. It's even uh, the speech that I'm saying, the physical speech. Now I could be distracted in the middle of seven things and I could quickly do the blessing, you know, just having basic, basic intention in mind that I'm blessing bread for Shabbat as a Jew. And that's the mitzvah and it's done. But that's going to be just a mitzvah with a body. If I want to add soul to that mitzvah, that's where I'm going to add love and fear that I generate in my meditative practice. And that will enhance the body of that mitzvah with a soul. And of course, we know in life, a body, you have to have it to live a life. But a body without a soul is, uh, is missing a lot. Uh, one of the great masters of this tradition said uh, that although... A mitzvah done without kavanah does make a home for God here in the lowest realms. If you do it without uh, kavanah, it really is uh, a dark home, so to speak. It's not a, a beautiful lit home. So once we create that home with the mitzvah, we want to light up that home with the light of all of our kavanah. Now, I want to go over uh, what we introduced last week because this, this uh, chapter can be a little confusing. So I want to pull up my... Uh, I want to pull up, I just lost track of a wonderful Google presentation. Let me, let me pull it up again. Okay, I'm pulling up, here we are. Got it. So for anyone, I know there's some people that, uh, that are uh, joining us who uh, know the Tanya a lot more deeply than I do. And also as we go through this chapter, You'll probably look back on how I'm going to explain this coming chapter as an oversimplification where it doesn't look right based on some of the conversations coming up, and it's true. So for anyone who's watching, uh, I'm so glad you're here, who's uh, very knowledgeable about the Tanya, I'd like to present a real oversimplification of the discussion of contraction versus expansion and concealment and revelation and light and essence and God's will. It, when you go through the chapter, you'll see all these terms 
they, depending on what the Alter Rebbe is talking about, it can be a little confusing. So I want to I want to create a very simple image or metaphor that we can use to uh, keep ourselves all going in one direction. So I'm going to share my screen here, and that is. <laughs> Beautiful. I assume you can see this now, Mitzvah versus Kavanah. Everyone can see that? Nod your head if you can. Yeah? Good. Oh, there it is. <laughs> so, on the one hand, in the world, it's concealed that the world is being created by God everywhere all the time. And that's true in the lowest worlds, and even to some sense in the spiritual worlds, God's essence is hidden in all those worlds. They're God's, hi Linda, welcome. So when I look at anything in the physical world, I see just a microphone, just a computer, just a building, just a tree. And God's essence is completely hidden from me. We're going to call that hester panim, hiding God's face. So even when you look at a person, you could think the person is just a living being that's existing of its own, and it's hidden that that person is actually something God is creating. When it comes to mitzvahs, it's exactly the opposite. Whereas everything in the physical world certainly has God's face, God's essence hidden completely, in a mitzvah, as we learned, that is completely transparent. When you look at a mezuzah, when you look at a Sefer Torah in the scroll, in the ark behind me, uh, when, you, when, you, when you look at a, a young child lighting Shabbat candles, that's, that's God's will, right? I know it looks like the physical world, but God's essence is now completely transparent in that act. So on the one hand, you have God's essence, which is completely hidden in the physical world and completely transparent in a mitzvah of any kind. But then we have the light, the radiance, the manifestation of that that is in that mitzvah. And there you have different levels. There you have different levels. So the mitzvah is on the one hand completely transparent, but that's just the body of the mitzvah. To add the light that's coming, there you need the kavanah. So let's look at this in terms of the mitzvah versus the kavanah. Or revealing essence, as in a mitzvah always reveals God's essence, God's essence isn't hidden, versus shining light through that mitzvah, which is a different different idea. Right? I look at a coin in a charity box, God's essence is right there. It's transparent. I can see it's, it's tzedakah, it's what God wants, it's God's will. But how much light is in that mitzvah? That's a different question. So I want us to think about it in terms of, uh, say, a doorway or a window, a wall. The physical world is like a wall where you can't see past it. So no matter what I'm looking at, I just see wall. I don't see that God is behind it, uh, creating it. In a mitzvah, I see right away God's essence is there. This, God's face isn't hidden. So imagine, this is a basic mitzvah. Imagine I'm here, and I'm looking through my door, through a little peephole. So it's a very contracted space, as it were. And I'm looking and seeing what's on the outside. Can I definitely see what's on the outside? Right? Of course, the answer is yes. Even if I'm only looking through a contracted little peephole, I can see what kind of day it is. I can see who's standing there. It's transparent. I can see clearly that there's something on the other side. Right? But if I'm in this room, how much light is coming through that peephole? Only a tiny amount. Only a contracted amount of that light is coming through. That is what a mitzvah is without any kavanah. Yes, it's transparent. You look at it, you can, if you look at it carefully, and you can even go smaller, you can use a microscope if you like, with a, even a little microscopic little piece I'm looking at. But whatever it is, it's transparent. I can see what's on the other side, and it's God, God's essence. What if I add a little kavanah? Okay, now imagine I'm standing in front of this door, and I've got not a little people, but I've got a little glass window. But it's the same thing. I'm looking through, I definitely see what's on the other side, daylight, building, person, it's transparent, I can see it. I got that, I got that window, but now this is gonna let a little more light into the room. That's adding more kavanah to the mitzvah. And let's go on. Let's say I have a full window. Does this full window show me with any more certainty what's on the outside than this people? If I see it, I see it, right? I see 
the sun, I see the day, I know it's, I know it's daytime, I know if there's a person standing outside my window. But having more kavana, again, brings more light into my room. Even though even the peephole let me see for sure, God's essence is there. And finally, of course, if you have the, the full fourth level of kavana that we will learn about, now imagine a room with, you know, wall-to-wall windows, light is streaming in. I'm just as certain that it's daytime looking through my people here as I am through this gorgeous window. But what's, what's the state of being in this room? Light, it's flooded into the room. The feeling is so different. You feel like you're immersed in, in what's on the other side. That's a mitzvah done with full kavana, as we'll learn, the fourth level of kavana, the kavana of midaber, of, of, a, of a human. So this is, this is the basic model I want to use when discussing this chapter, which I hope is clearer than what we spoke about last week, that any mitzvah is transparent. It already has a little bit of glass I can see through. I know God's essence is there. God's, God is creating this mitzvah. God's behind it. It's just connected to God. But now when I add kavanah, I go from just a little light coming in to more, to more, to finally uh, the full exposure, as it were. Um, and so... You could talk it also about revelation versus illumination if you like, but any other terms you use get a little confusing, or concealment versus contraction. Um, but I think if I if I go into those terms, I'm going to confuse things. Let's just let's just keep it at this one uh, this one uh, conversation. So let me uh, stop sharing the screen. I lost where that was. There you go. So any, before I go on, any questions is God, about... Uh, is God's will the same thing as God's essence? Yeah, that's another one. So so you'll see the Altar Rebbe talks about Hester Pani, meaning God's essence is hidden. He also says the inner aspect of God's will, because will, of course, is, if you study the Kabbalah with us, will is Ratzon, that's within Keter. So it's kind of synonymous with God's essence in terms of this conversation. So So God's essence, God's will, yes. They're different at other times, but today they're they're synonymous. Okay. So, so Rick in particular, or anyone who who had complaints last week, is that does that give you a clear picture of what I tried to go through last week? Yeah, I think that helped a lot, actually. I don't understand when you start using the words contraction and concealment, it really kind of throws it, mixes it up. But I think what you did with the Kavanaugh made made a lot more sense, at least to yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. That's I, I'm going to avoid. In our basic model, using contraction, expansion, he pashtut, uh, and yeah. uh, also revelation, because uh, because you know you can see God's essence or it can be hidden, and then you have revelation of light, and 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 suddenly you're not sure where you are. So I, I'd like to stick with my window and my door and light versus uh, Hester Panim. Yes, Sharon. Um, I. I guess there's like different learning methods, but when you're, you were looking, I get what you said exactly. And it, it's perfect. But I also, in my own mind, immediately thought of a dimmer switch on a light in the, in our dining room. And if you have the lights off, you can't see anything if it's dark. And if you put the light on, you put the tiny bit of dimmer, you can kind of see what's in the room. And the more you push the dimmer switch up and the lighter it gets, the more you can see like everything that's there. That's, yeah, that works too. That works too. I have another teacher I learned with who talks about it in terms of yeah, I like the light the, there, but the amount of light is increased when you use Kavanaugh, and that, that works fine as well if, if, if you prefer that. Yeah, it was because of the expand. Well, I see, like, like your windows to me were more like expansion. You keep expanding the view, but here it, it all works. I'm okay with it. Thank you. Yeah, and like you said, th these are all metaphors to help us understand something outside of time and space. So Whichever yeah, one uh, up because everybody's different in how they absolutely perceive, yeah. you know. Great. So with that in mind, let's dive in. So let's go uh, start at five thirty-four. We're in uh, chapter thirty-eight of the Tanya of this edition. Uh, so let's start. I think uh, Ruth, you're going to start. You want to do the Hebrew for us, Ruth? You're such good in you have such good Hebrew. The off. Uh, can you unmute yourself? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if you unmuted yourself. We need you to unmute. There you go. Ve'af. Ve'af shebishnehem or echad shave b'fchinat hester panim. True in terms. You go ahead. True in terms of the concealment of countenance, the degree to which the countenance 
the inner aspect of the divine life force is concealed, the light, that is, the divine creative life force is the same in both body and soul. It is concealed equally in both. Makes sense. So like we said, the concealment of God's countenance, God's inner aspect, God's will, that's the same in both. Uh in that in that uh it's concealed completely right uh, the garment in which the light hides conceals and clothes itself are identical in body and the right so here we're talking about here we're talking about anything in the physical world its energy comes through either klipas noga or the three impure klipot. It has a soul and has a body, but God's essence is hidden in the soul and the body, right? You, you can't, it's, you wouldn't know that God's creating the soul of a tree or the body of a tree. You think it, it has its own independent soul, its own independent body. There's no, it's completely hidden in terms of Hester Panim and God's essence. And let's go uh, with Maxine next. Ki shnehem heim me'olam hazeh shebichlaluto mistater b'shave ha'or for both body and soul are of this world where throughout the world and all its creatures, spiritual as well as physical, the light and life force issuing from the breath of God's mouth are equally concealed. I got a little confused on this line. I spoke to a teacher and he said to me, yeah, the altar is using the quote, the breath of God's mouth. But he's really talking about speech, as in you talk about, you know, the breath of someone's mouth is kind of alluding to their speech. So he's not talking about the breath, the breath specifically that was blown into the human soul that's different than speech. He's really talking about speech in general and the breath of God's mouth. It also means speech. Right. So everything, everything comes from God speaking and, and that source is equally concealed in everything. The concealment of the countenance and by the descent of the life force from level to level by means of numerous powerful contractions through the various levels constituting the chain-like succession of worlds. Finally, clothing itself in Kalipa Noga in order to give life to the totality of this material world. So hi to, uh, hi to uh, Cindy and Cheryl and Susan watching on Facebook. You can definitely write comments here and we will, uh, we will get you into the conversation. And you see here already gets a little confusing because now we talked about seems to mean contractions in terms of how God's essence is hidden, whereas we talk also about seems to mean being how much of the light is able to come in. So, so whenever you learn Kabbalah and Hasidus, you'll notice depending on what you're talking about, a word means one thing or another thing. It can be a little confusing. So, let's let's not let's not uh, pick apart the word. Let's stick with our. Uh, Hester Panim versus uh, Shining Light as our model. Okay. Uh, like fine clothing stuff in the Klippa Noga. So everything comes through the Klippa Noga or the three impure Klippot becomes physical world and God's essence that's creating it is totally hidden. And he goes through the categories, right? Dehayinu kol dvarim hamutarim vaha teorim mimena al yada. This means one, all things of this world that are permitted and pure, which receive their vitality directly via Klipanoga and from and through Klipanoga evolves. Two, all impure forbidden things, which derive their vitality from the three impure Klipanoga from the three impure klipa, yet their vitality too stems from noga, since it is intermediary level between holiness, which all life originates, and the three impure klipa, as mentioned above. So for those who've been here from the beginning, we got 
Klipa Noga, which is uh, the level of shell of reality, the external facade of reality that has some godly light mixed in it. And we Jews work with that and elevate that spark, that light back up. And also three empirically put, which is just complete uh, byproduct. There's no, there's no functional purpose within the Jewish soul system for those three empirically put, no normative uh, way to use it. So it applies to all of that. The whole physical world, whichever one of the shells it comes through, the light is completely hidden from, uh, light is completely hidden from us when we're looking at it. Who's got those chimes going on? There you go, okay. Now he's going to bring in a second metaphor that we're going to use uh, to understand better this idea of a soul and a body of a mitzvah, and also to learn and categorize which level we can attain when we are doing a mitzvah with our kavanah, and how much, how much good it does in the world around us. This metaphor uses the four categories of beings that are in the world. And the reason there's four categories of beings is because everything stems from God. God's most transcendent name has four letters. So everything in the world can be divided into four categories in one way or another because it comes out of that structure. And the four categories of living things, sorry, the four categories of existing things in the world are domem, domem, which means inanimate, a stone or, or a, a log, right? Someach, which means growing things, a flower, a, a live tree, a leaf. Chai, which means animal life. So now you're talking about uh, bugs, alligators, birds, etc. And then midaber, or midaber, right? Which is humanity, so the speaking category. So there's four categories of things that exist, and everything fits into that. Uh, you know, a meteor going through space is, uh, is domem. Uh, everything from a, a, a blade of grass to a redwood is someach. Any 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 animal that that moves around from I guess a, an amoeba to a, a blue whale that's chai. And then humanity, we have our own. Oh, Joyce is asking what page are we on? Uh, we are on page five thirty seven, the top of five thirty seven. Uh, and if you don't have the text, just email uh, Maya at temple hyphen israel.org and she'll send you uh, the text so these four categories when you look at them yes it's true it's completely concealed that god's essence is creating them no matter what i look at from a, a pebble to a human being it's i would i could think that it exists on its own however in terms of what do you say here the contraction contraction and expansion of the light and vitality that's in them and again the terms get a little a little mixed up, so let's not let's not uh, parse those. But in terms of the light and life force that's in things, certainly I see that there is a lot more light and life and power in a tiger or or in a, a a dog or anything than there is in a pebble. The pebble, its whole light and life force is just it sits and it exists, right? It doesn't doesn't grow, it doesn't move, it just exists. That's its whole force. It's very contracted form of of light. Uh, a plant suddenly changes shape, it grows, it seeks water, it's, it's a whole other thing. An animal now has uh, emotions, it has intellect, it, it, move, it can move around perhaps, uh, it has a personality, a whole other level of light and life. And with a human, you even have abstract intelligence, free will, which we'll discuss, and a whole other degree of light and life flowing into it. So just like these four categories, of existing beings, they all have God's essence hidden, and yet there's more light. That window is much wider and bigger when it comes to an animal or a human. Same thing with the kavanah that we might infuse in a mitzvah. The kavanah also is going to come, we'll see, in four levels, and each of those levels it has a specific definition, and it has much more light uh, flowing into it. That makes sense. This is this is uh, kind of the second the second model the author Rebbe uses. This This is clear for people. Any questions? No? Good. Let's go on. In the physical body, who are we at? No, I think you skipped the bottom of page 536. Yeah, you skipped. Okay. Oh, nevertheless? nevertheless? Okay, yeah. thank you. 
אף על פי כן, ההערה שהיא המשכת וחי, וחיות, החיות אשר השם מאיר ומחיה דרך לבוש זה, אינה שווה בכולן בבחינת צמצום והתפשטות. Nevertheless, the godly illumination, meaning the flow of vitality by which God illumines and gives light to all creatures of this world by way of this garment that is the Khalifa Noga, is not the same for them all, and the difference between the life force of the various creatures is in terms of contraction and expansion. In so some if, if you, yeah, go ahead. In some creatures, the life force is constricted and limited, while in others, it finds broader expression. And I like, I like the uh, paragraph here below in English. And now we see another set of words that simsum vihit pashut, which means contraction. So for us, that's, that's the, the, the window getting smaller and smaller. So you just have a contracted amount of light coming through versus expansion, hit pashut, that's now my window getting bigger. But uh, uh, why don't we go ahead, uh, why don't we go ahead um, and, and Dan, let's read uh, the paragraph here, the difference between. You'll need to unmute. Yeah. The, <clears throat> uh, the difference between concealment, Hester, of the life force and its contraction, symptom, can be expressed as follows. You wanna keep going? Please, yeah, yeah. Suppose one hangs a thick curtain on a window to screen out the sunlight. The light entering the room through the curtain will be of an entirely different quality. In fact, it might be described as a mere echo of the original light. This is concealment. If on the other hand, one boards up the window and leaves only a tiny hole by which the light may pass, the light shining through the hole, though greatly restricted, will be the same qualitatively as the original light. This is what is meant by contraction. So it is true with regard to our subject. Kalipat Noga is the thick curtain which veils the divine creative power equally from all creatures of this world. This curtained light varies, however, from one creature to another in degree of contraction. The Alter Rebbe now goes on to enumerate, enumerate these differences. Beautiful, so it makes sense. I think that that's the model I'm trying to use. Uh, and in terms of our conversation, you can really be black and white, right? Concealment of the countenance means nothing gets through. Contraction means it's the same light, just much, much, much less of it. Uh, but also, if you've been looking at the whole structure of, of the cosmos, each of the spiritual worlds also has a contraction in between it. Uh, so this, this this, these definitions are important for the whole study of the structure. But for today, let's stick with uh, Hester. Concealment means no light gets through, or perhaps a curtain and only a little, a little impression of the light. And contraction means it is the same light, just much, much less of it. So like we said, a pebble has much less of, of this light coming through, and a human being or, or a, a dolphin has a tremendous amount of light coming through because of all that intellect and emotion of the higher life beings. So why, why does it have to be concealed or contracted? Well, well, if God's essence wasn't concealed, then there'd be no world because that's the highest truth from God's perspective. Mm -hmm. So if, if, God, if God didn't conceal God's essence, then the truth would be there's only God here and the world and God hasn't changed since creation and, and there's no world, it would be gone. So for there to be a world, God has to conceal God's essence completely. Otherwise, there's no, no movie for you and me. Simpson. <laughs> Simpson, exactly. Yeah. In the physical body of a living creature and in an absolutely innate, inanimate being such as stones or earth, in which no life or spirituality are apparent since they lack even the power of growth, the ray of the divine creative power is in a state of unparalleled contraction. Right. So minute. So minute is the life force within these in inanimate beings that they lack even the power of growth. So you don't think about it necessarily, but why can't a stone grow? 
Right? Why can't why can't uh, a mountain grow? Why can't uh, etc.? It's because of the category of light that's coming through. It doesn't bring with it the capacity. It's not a vessel for the capacity for growth. Uvatsomeach. This is category two in plants. Haheara ina bitzimtum gadol kol kach. So, uh, Norina, are we going to go with you now, or? And after Sharon. Okay, so Sharon, go ahead. In vegetation, the ray is not so greatly contracted. The phenomenon of growth indicates the presence of something more than mere physical matter. Some degree of spirituality is in evidence. Right, so you get the idea. There's categories. And same thing with kavana, as we will see. When I add kavana to a mitzvah, I can add kavana on the level of just domem, just basic, of tzameach, a little more. And then I can make a leap to the level of chai or even to the level of medaber, depending on the quality of my intensity and focus. In general, all things in this world are divided into four categories, mineral, vegetable, animal, and man, literally the speaker. And, and lovely, I think that in Hebrew, humanity, one of the terms for us is called medaber, the speaker, that, that that's what distinguishes us. Uh, Judaism speech is not just a, uh, a, 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 a evolutionary reaction that helped us survive by communicating information like bees communicate, uh, you know, pathways to, to flowers. But really, it is it is one of the highest spiritual expressions we have, that, that when a human speaks, they're channeling just something very lofty, very spiritual into reality. And it's, it's not uh, it's not just a, a little biological quirk of our species, it's, it defines us. Uh, so let's, uh, Paula, would you like to read for us? Now, just as the illumination and the flow of vitality found in the mineral and vegetable categories, there's no comparison or likeness to the illumination and flow of vitality clothed in animals and man since in the latter two categories, it is clearly apparent that they are alive. I get such pleasure, as I said, Paula and everybody, I get such pleasure at how we all can just mute ourselves and unmute. Remember six months ago how hard Zoom was? And now we're all just, we're all just naturals at it. That was beautiful, Paula. <laughs> it's great. Look at us, right? So, so the four letters of the divine name from which they're derived, that's all four categories, that's what's creating these four categories. And there's also the same four categories in uh, our mitzvot. And just as the illumination, the light, the size of the window, you can't compare a pebble to, uh, to uh, a kangaroo or a human. Although, uh, here's a little side. Although, uh, Joyce, do you want to you want to read for us, or uh, should we go back to the top? We're at the Although, bottom of five thirty eight. I see it. Although in all four categories, the divine animating light is the same in terms of the quote concealment of continents. In all four categories, the inner aspect of the divine light is concealed equally. And in all four categories, it is clothed in the same garment, name, namely the garment, veil of Noga. Hence, in none of these categories is it apparent that their vitality is actually godliness. Yet, despite this equality, the vitality of inanimate beings and plants is incomparable of that to that of animals and man. Similarly, if I keep going or? Uh, let, let's stop there, right? So, although, as we've said a bunch of times, Hester Panim, the concealment of God's countenance, God's essence, God's most inner, inner creative force and will is the same in all these categories. You can't compare the light that's flowing in. That's, that's a, a massive window versus a little, a little uh, slot in the door. Similarly, and now we move to our subject. 
Kach ein erich vidim yon klal bein herat vam shachat or ein sof baruchu shehu pnimiut ritzono hi parech bli hester panim ulavush klal. Let's go back to Ruth, please. Uh, similarly, and if you'll unmute. Yeah, Ruth, have you got the uh, unmute handy? You wanna you wanna unmute your uh, microphone. Okay. Good. Uh, similarly, there is no comparison or likeness between the illumination and flow of the blessed Ain so flight, meaning the inner aspect of his will without concealment of countenance and with no garment whatsoever. When Hamira and Lubeshet be mitzvot masyot mamash, Rechen be mitzvot ha taliot be dibur uvitui. As it radiates in and is clothed within the mitzvot consisting of action, whether actual action or mitzvot performed through speech and verbal articulation, which is regarded as actual action as mentioned above, when performed without kavanah. Right, so that was, a, that was a bit of a bracket there. So any action mitzvah, including the proto-action mitzvah of speaking, right? We, remember, we included that in, in action. Uh, so anything, any, any physical action, you can't compare a mitzvah done without kavanah. So I've just basically, uh, I woke up and I'm saying the Shema because that's what a Jew does and, and I want to get through it and, and I know I'm saying a prayer and I'm done versus one done with kavanah where i sit and i uh i meditate on my love for god i meditate on god's greatness i meditate on how the whole world doesn't exist actually and it inspires me with love and awe and then from that state now i say the shema within with deeper feeling and deeper focus and and, and, and an intent to connect to the ain self somehow through this mitzvah you can't compare the light and life force between those two the same way you can't compare a pebble to a human. The illumination of the Yang Sof found in these mitzvot bears no likeness or compassion with the superior illumination and flow of the blessed Yang Sof light radiating and clothed in the Kavana of the mitzvot of action. Yeah, and to clarify, he's, he's specific. He's, he's not even saying that this mitzvah has, has more light than this mitzvah. He's saying the actual physical body of the mitzvah contains less light than the kavanah that I'm putting into the mitzvah. So when I'm saying that Shema in the morning, yeah, it's true. If I say it without kavanah, that, that's a, a mitzvah without a soul and has less light. But even if I add full kavanah, I should know that the physical action I'm doing of saying the Shema or whatever physical mitzvah I'm doing, that has much less light than the Kavanah that I'm creating that I'm attaching to that mitzvah. Remember, you still have to have the mitzvah to start. We called the mitzvah the one and the Kavanah the zeros. So in Judaism, just having Kavanah on its own, you can have 10 zeros in a row, it still adds up to, to nothing. It's, it's lost, it's, it's, not, it's not grounded. A mitzvah is just a one. But when you start with a one, when you start with a mitzvah, and you have that, now you add the zeros. Now what happens it's times 10, times 100, times 1,000. So that's the key. The, the action is the core. You need it to, to get anywhere. But action alone, that's like a one without, without zeros after it. You want to keep adding those zeros so you get uh, more and more light, more and more dynamic flow. Yes, Maxine. Well, if... All these things have souls or lights or whatever. I mean, should we be allowed to eat them? <laughs> <laughs> well put. That's a very succinctly put. So, uh, you know, my, my, my teacher label, I had this conversation with him five, six years ago now. It's one of the first things we talked about, maybe the third topic we looked at. And uh, I, I've been a vegetarian, a lot of, well, for long stretches in my life, very seriously into it. I, I thought about this question. 
I think it's legit, right? I mean, what gives us the right to eat another living being? And when I brought this up with Label, he asked me, Michael, what right do you have to murder a carrot? Mm -hmm. And he's not being he's not being flippant. He says, what right do you have to eat a carrot? That carrot is growing. It, it's 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 taking in water. It's pushing up towards the light. I'm I'm pulling this carrot out of the ground. I'm ending its life and I'm eating it. What what right do I really have to eat a carrot? And we can have a whole class on this. You can go into it. But when you look at how many carrots I've eaten in my life, mountains of vegetables, mountains of you know, add maybe fish, add, add, add dairy products, add eggs, add animals. What right do I, one being, have to end all these lives? whether they're vegetative or animal, just because I'm hungry, just because I should survive, that's a bit self-centered. So in Judaism, we don't really distinguish between, between eating, a, a, ending a life of a vegetable or ending a life of an animal. If I'm doing it for self-centered purposes, I'm not ever allowed to do any of it. If I'm just eating because I feel like eating or I, I'm emotional eating or, or, or I, I love buttered carrots and just taste good to me, I'm never allowed to do that with any living being, including a plant. The only reason I'm allowed to eat anything that exists is if I get permission from the one that's creating it and I use it for a, a higher purpose. And in that case, now, you know, uh, now we can include all the living beings in it that are kosher, but I have to treat it properly, kindly as possible. I have to have a blessing and then I have to do something because now that if I eat a chicken, now that living being is a part of me. And its energy is dependent on me to elevate it back to its source, as we'll see. And I'm actually serving, I know for vegetarians, it's like, yeah, really. I'm serving the chicken by allowing its energy to go back to its source when I help another person do a good thing with it, an other-centered thing. And God forbid, I eat the chicken and then I go and I do something self-centered. Now I've taken its energy and I've driven it back down into the klipa and I've harmed the chicken. So for us, the question is not, can you eat an animal versus a plant? The question is, can you eat anything? And when you do, what's your responsibility? Now, I mean, you can certainly add to that when God first created the world, God didn't give us permission to eat animals. And then after, uh, right after the flood, was that right, uh, Noreen? I'm, I'm remembering correctly. After the flood, God said, now you can eat animals. So right. there certainly is a place to say, even in Judaism, that the ideal is not to eat animals. Um, but it never goes so far as to say, like like in the East, that, that uh, eating animals is really a crime against their species and we should never do it, as long as we're doing it for, for the purpose of bettering the world. Long answer, yeah? Is that, is that that's, any thoughts about that? I guess you can rationalize. Yeah, you can see yeah. that as a rationalization. Well, so God, says, you know, God says it's for the purpose, when you said about the purpose of bettering the world. So if man had this inclination towards uh, some kind of violence uh, and God gave him the ability to eat the animals, then that quells that. So that's in a sense, bettering the world. Yeah, you can, you can, uh, you can go there. You, could, you can make an argument that uh, better that we eat animals than we eat each other alive. <laughs> So uh, if you like, that's, that's a bit dark, but yeah. uh, it certainly is there. Yeah, Sharon? So to, to really <laughs> compress this idea, it, God puts us here to, so that he can be, he, put, he made our world so he can be here. And so there can be like a phys, an expression of him other than the divine light. And he... And part of our being here is that we have to sustain ourselves physically with food. And we're allowed to eat animals even, and I'm really mixed on this whole deal. But anyway, we're allowed to eat animals so long as we are living a good life and, and doing God's will and doing what we should be doing. And I, I would add from the Alter Rebbe's perspective, so long as it's within the soul system of, you know, Kashrut, and that includes not being not being uh, cruel in any way to the animal beyond slaughtering it, which you could say is cruel, but in a painless way as possible. Also saying a blessing. Um, and then once that's done, now it's dynamic spiritual light. Now being a good person, doing a mitzvah, helping another person, that actually elevates the light back to its source. So it's, it's part of the spiritual life cycle of every living being on the planet for at some point to interact with a human to be elevated back to its source. 
you know, I mean, ethno, ethno what is it, uh, sociologists or, or uh, you know, academic people might look at that and say, well, that's, <laughs> you know, how do you know? So ultimately it comes down to who's your authority. That's what the Torah says. Well, Native Americans believe that, that, that the divine God is in everything. Uh, animate and inanimate and and when they and their ritual uh you know not not kashrut and 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 not our blessings their ritual is to thank the animal before they eat it mm. for giving itself to them and it's all and it's it's part of an organic whole of all the world it's the same so we're we're honoring god when we follow his rules and do what he's supposed to do and part of it is there's this necessity of eating other an, e eating other animals because we are. Yeah, and, and, and you know, of course, someone argue it's not a necessity. I have another teacher, Gutman Locks, who's a big chassid in, in Jerusalem, but he was uh, he was an Indian guru uh, for many years in life, a powerful one, and you know, he he uh, he still maintains that we don't have to eat uh, living beings. So, you know, but you, he you would got friends in the Jewish her. world that agree, but. Absolutely, you know, there's there's 70 soul pathways, and, and I don't I'm not a, I'm not an expert on the Native American, but their pathway I'm sure includes honoring the animal in that way, and that's the same thing with us. All right, let's like move that. on. I like it's, that it's a great soul pathway. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's a great conversation, but let's let's continue uh, on from that sidebar. Someone help me. Where are we? All four categories. No comparison. Here we go. Maybe we did that with the illumination and flow of the Ain Self Light, radiating and clothed in the Kavanah of the Mitzvot of Action. Meaning God, man's intention to attach himself to God by fulfilling his will as expressed in the mitzvot, since he and his will are one. Similarly, with regard to kavanah in prayer, the recital of Shema and its blessings, and in other blessings, where through one's kavanah in them, he attaches his thought and intellect to God. It is not that- Yeah, let's, uh, let's, yeah let's, let's save that for- Let's start again next week on the fifth of Nisan. Well, I'd like to do a little meditation just to keep our keep our practice going. But that really is sometimes in, in our in our community we talk about kavana and it's a bit vague. It, it sort of means everything from focus to how I feel to the mood in the room to you know what what how I understand the thing. In Kabbalah, kavana is specifically the the Kabbalistic emotions of our soul, so Chesed and Gevura being the, being the main ones, and Tiferet as well. So I want to have clear in my mind Chesed especially, loving kindness, and Gevura, strength and respect. Those are the two emotions I want to have engaged. And then also in my mind, the intent should be, I'm not just doing this mitzvah because I got myself excited about mitzvahs, right? I mean, you can pump yourself up to do anything. You go to a Michigan, uh, Michigan State game, <laughs> right? And you see a lot of Kavanah. Right, so it's a lot of excitement, but but uh, you know what's the focus of that? Far be it for me to say anything negative about about Michigan and Michigan State football games, but it's you know you work yourself up and you can get very excited about about uh, sports or about uh, food or about uh, any topic. That's part of being human is is being excited and having uh, passion. So it's not just that I happen to be excited. Maybe I just pump myself up. It's that I'm excited to connect to the one that gave us the mitzvahs. It's not about the commandment, it's about the, the relationship with the commander, the one who commanded. It's about using mitzvahs as a tzavta, as a connection. So the kavanah always in Kabbalah wants to include the sense that I want to cleave, I want to bond, I want to have a relationship with the Ein Sof. And this is the only way. I'm a limited being. There's no way in the physical limited world to connect with the Ein Sof other than the channels the Ein Sof opens. And there, if I have clear in my mind, I'm doing this mitzvah to connect with God, and I love connecting with God, the creator of everything, who's so in, who's infinite. Uh, I have respect for God and, and, and how God wants me to treat living beings and everything else. Now, that's kavanah that the Altar Rebbe is talking about, and we'll learn later in the chapter how we can use that kavanah to elevate the mitzvahs and really uh, change the world. 
thanks to everybody joining us on Facebook. We're going to do a quick meditation to finish. Amy, Francine, uh, if you want to join us, please find yourself in a comfortable position. It doesn't matter how you're seated. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can be lying or sitting, whatever's comfortable. Please uh, close your eyes if that's comfortable for you as well, so we can focus more on the inner. Let's uh, let our breathing open up to include all four stages of breath, just like the four letters in God's name. We have four stages in breath. Nice, slow, deep breaths. And join me as we breathe in for one, two, three, four. Stay expanded. Two, three, four. Breathing out. Two, three, four. And stay empty. Three. Four, back in, two, three, four, stay there. Release the breath, two, three, four, stay there. Keeping that rhythm, try and breathe through your nose if you can. And as you're breathing, be sensitive to the difference in temperature on the spot under your nostrils. Perhaps cooler air as you're breathing in. And then warmer air as you're breathing out on that spot under your nostril. Keeping this breathing pattern and knowing that you've already created positive change in your brain and in your body, all sorts of health benefits. Very good for de-stressing to breathe this way for five or 10 minutes. Let's open up a wisdom gateway for our meditation. That will be the space between the end of the in-breath and the beginning of the out-breath. There's a space there, an opening. We'll call that our wisdom gateway. And that gateway, let's put, uh, let's say, let's have a door on that gateway and put a window in that door. See tremendous light streaming in from the other side of that window. And as you breathe, allow that window to grow bigger and bigger. So more and more light is pouring into your mind and your heart. Now let that window fill the entire space of the doorway. Now expand the gateway in your mind even more. See brighter, brighter light and more colors on the other side. As you let that image fill your mind and your heart, notice any emotions emerging as you picture that light flowing in, bathing all your actions, all your thoughts, all your words of speech with divine light today and this week. See the beginnings of any feelings emerging from that image of divine light. I invite you, feel free to open your eyes for a moment and pause uh, the YouTube or the Facebook if you're watching this after the fact. If you're with us today, we'll need to uh, wiggle our toes and open our eyes, but you can certainly pause and stay in this state for uh, 10, 15 minutes. It's a very, very good practice to include perhaps daily. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. If you're on Facebook, I'm going to... Uh, sign off Facebook. And, and uh, if you'd like to be in our class, once again, email Maya at temple-israel.org. It's quite a community. We're up to, I don't know if you guys know here on the Zoom, but we have uh, people learning uh, from classes that we had even two years ago. We have over a thousand hours every month of learning happening, of Kabbalah being learned on our YouTube channel, of new students coming, reviewing classes that we've had. So uh, if you'd like to join us, absolutely come and join this, this big community and email maya at temple-israel.org. We'll get you here in the Zoom. But I'm going to go... Uh, so long on Facebook. Thanks for joining us. And uh, if you're on the Zoom, hang out and we'll continue the discussion, answer any questions.